And at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce our, our final keynote of the day, Adrian Kumar. Adrian is VP of Solutions Design North America for, for HDHL Supply Chain. Um, he's been involved in the supply chain aspects of a number of businesses at McDonald's and at uh, Lobelal Com uh, Companies Limited. Um, he's, he's in charge or chartered with uh, the department who's servicing uh, all market verticals, including e-commerce, automotive, con consumer life sciences, and a variety of other things. He manages about 50 different people, and he's here today to speak on designing mobile picking robots for e-commerce fulfillment, an extremely hot market at this particular time with serious problems, and mobile robots can solve a lot of those. So with that, I'd like to introduce Adrian. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so thanks for the introduction, and uh, as discussed, I will be talking about uh, mobile collaborative robotic uh, robotic picking, particularly for the e-fulfillment, what we're doing in the e-fulfillment industry, and uh, hopefully uh, get into some some case studies and um, some some real life examples of what we're doing. So, uh, what we'll what we'll do is we'll we'll first talk about DHL supply chain and our digitalization initiative. Then we'll talk about the e-commerce profile and why it's different and why it is driving a lot of robotic picking solutions, talk about the different robotic picking options and strategies on the market themselves, get into a little bit of a deep dive about swarming. That's a, strat that's a robotic picking strategy that we've deployed uh, that's uh, been very successful for us, so we'll go into a little bit of a deep dive about that. Then we'll talk about automated picking and wrap up with some conclusions. Okay, so DHL, if you're, how many people here are familiar with DHL? Okay, that, that, that's great. Uh, DHL, if you know us and you know our supply chain division, uh, we've been actively involved in research and innovation for, for a long time. And, and we've published um, trend, trend radars, research reports, various white papers, uh, you name it, we have a big innovation center in Germany. We have a lot of people dedicated to continuously researching innovation. But now the, the pace of change, the pace of digitization and disruption is increasing at a rate we've never seen before. And there's just so much going on with, with the supply chain and we feel our industry is really ripe for disruption. So what we've done is we've kind of taken a step back to say, okay, we need to embrace some of this change a lot more and, and not necessarily wait for the right opportunity. Do we have the right operation to put stuff in? But really get out in front of this and test and pilot these different types of technologies. So we've set up different trend communities and these are cross-functional teams. And really the goal in mind here is to set up these trend communities and to bring in different people across the business uh, so that they can come together, they can share ideas, and potentially get sponsorship for different pilots and initiatives and hopefully implement, implementations with this new technology out there to really force our operations to embrace these technologies because we know this change is coming. And today I'm gonna talk about the, the trend community that I'm responsible for, which is probably um, you know, the, the one that we're seeing the biggest impact in and that's warehouse robotics and auto-guided vehicles. <clears throat> so, so why is this so important? Well, if you think of a traditional warehouse, and everyone said they're familiar with, with DHL, so you know, I, I would guess that a lot of people here are, are familiar with, with warehousing, but a traditional warehouse, and this uh, traditional warehousing has been DHL supply chains, bread and butter, especially in the United States. Uh, traditional warehouse might be 500,000 plus square feet, uh, and you're moving product in a lot of bulk movements. You're storing product in pallets, you're moving products with forklifts, and they're large orders, full pallet picks, you're picking full truck loads. Uh, so a big 500,000 warehouse might have no more than 50 people in it. And that's the way a lot of our operations run, and that works for that type of profile. But an e-commerce profile, in an e-commerce profile, the, the, the orders are a lot different. You're just picking a handful of items. You have tens of thousands more items on hand 
lower inventory quantities, and as a result, it's a lot more labor intensive. And you might have, in a 50,000 square foot warehouse, upwards of 500 or so employees. And these are the most challenging orders to pick. This is really the most challenging distribution profile um, that, that you could be uh, faced with. Typical e-commerce order, usually just a handful of items. And even if, even if there's some correlation between those items, as you see here, a back to school order, household purchases, office supplies, there's still gonna be a bit of diversity even within those, those, those family groups. And it's just gonna be a small handful of items. And, and you guys know from uh, Amazon and how you're incented to order, you're really incented to order when you need something, not to hold back your order till the end of the week, till you can make a bigger order so that the distribution center can get economies of scale. You're placing orders all the time and distribution centers are responding to those orders, one or two items on them. So that is very, very challenging to pick in a distribution center. For the most part, most distribution centers have had manual picking. This is the type of picking that is prevalent in most distribution centers operations. Just think about picking in a supermarket. You're going up and down with a cart and picking the items you need, but only picking you know, one or two items per order. So there's a lot of advantages with doing it this way. First off, it's a relatively low capital solution. Systematically, it's pretty easy to kind of direct, hey, just go and pick the items that are needed on that particular order. Um, but as you can imagine, you could run into a lot of congestion. If you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of orders on a particular day, even upwards of a million plus orders, how do you throw that much labor into an operation like this? And, and of course, it's hard to get labor these days, but how would you even physically do that without running into congestion, without running into all kinds of different bottlenecks? So, that, so that's a challenge. Now, warehouse automation has been around for a long time. So there's a lot of different uh, automation options out there and, th and they've been around 40 plus years and, and really in the last 20 years there's been more and more technologies on the marketplace. Saying that, most operations have stayed relatively manual, but probably about 80% plus of the operations are, are pretty manual in terms of they're just using conventional forklifts, uh, pick carts, that type of equipment versus automated distribution centers, things like shuttles, conveyors, goods to person type technology, sorters, things like that. There's a reason why automation hasn't just taken off in your typical distribution center, why you know, 80% of the warehouses aren't automated today. And that's because automation needs a lot of fixed infrastructure. And for smaller to mid-size operations, they may not know, their pro know where their profile is going and, and, be, and be willing to place a bet on a relatively expensive automation system, which not, might not be able to scale and might not have the flexibility that they require. A traditional warehouse automation system requires its own infrastructure, its own infrastructure for storage, a storage system, a movement system, uh, its own uh, control systems as well. A lot of traditional automation looks like that. Now, I'm not knocking that. That, that is definitely for a lot of our customers on the, on the, on the larger, larger volume side. They can place a bet and, and that will be a very efficient way to handle their business. But for everyone else who is just growing and maybe doesn't know where their profile is gonna go, this type of automation may not be appropriate, may not have an obvious payback. So, you know, we want to improve our operations. We know they need to be more efficient, but some of the traditional automation systems just come with a lot of infrastructure. So this kind of brings us into the why robotics. Why robotics makes sense for a lot of our customers. You know, just to recap, the rise of e-commerce. The profile is more challenging. You require more labor in your operations. That labor is hard to find. 
Some of our operations ramp up from 200 people to 2,000 people. And we're competing, and every time the big, big mohemoth, they open up a warehouse right across the street. And they need 2,000 people, too. So how do you compete with that? It gets really, really hard to go out and find labor. And everyone's looking for that labor at the same time. And flexibility. Not everyone's willing to put bolts to the ground. You need flexibility. You need something that's scalable, that's flexible. And you know, in a lot of cases, for us, the answer have, have, have been these mobile, collaborative, robotic solutions that allow us to get some of the productivity increases, but not make necessarily that fixed infrastructure investments. And we'll talk about some of those different pick strategies right now. So even in a space as kind of narrow as this, like I'm talking about e-fulfillment, piece picking, and collaborative robots, even in a space as narrow as this, uh, there have been so many companies kind of sprouting up in the past five years or so with different types of solutions and really unique and creative strategies how they would introduce a robot into existing warehouse infrastructure and make the pick more efficient. And we really benefit from that as a provider, as DHL, to kind of take advantage of all that market creativity and all those options out there and then decide, hey, what's best for us and our, our customer, most of all, in a particular instance and based on their profile, their appetite for capital, et cetera. So different types of solutions. First solution is, hey, why not have a robot just follow the picker? Instead of the, instead of the operator pushing a big heavy cart up and down the warehouse, why not just have the cart follow the picker? Doesn't need to be really integrated to any systems Cart just needs to follow the picker, be able to detect where the picker is. Picker goes about, does their business as before. Next strategy. OK, why not have the robot lead the picker down the aisle and on, on its screen display what items the, the, the operator should be picking? This is just another strategy, still more or less a one-to-one -one ratio between the robot cart and the picker. But you, see, you start to see huge productivity increases because the picker no longer has to constantly reference their pick assist device. Now we start to kind of, in these zone-based strategies, break some of those paradigms of the picker and the robot kind of needing to be directly associated with each other and intertwined and say, hey, are there different types of strategies where we can reduce the amount of traveler the amount of traveling of the warehouse operator. And this gets into shuttle type strategies. Why not move the product from area to area in the warehouse? Similar to a traditional pick and pass conveyor system. Why not bring the order to different zones in the warehouse? Or a swarming strategy. Why not have the, 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 the pickers work in different zones in the warehouse and the robots come in and out of those different zones? Or retrieval robots. Why don't we have robots that can go lift stuff off shelves and bring it directly to a put wall where the, the picker can be stationary and doesn't have to move at all? A lot of trade-offs here. A lot of trade-offs between how many robots you need per person, the amount of capital you're looking at, and of course, the, the productivity increase. So different types of strategies, you know, from um, strategies that kind of deploy a picking cart uh, that kind of just replace the picking cart with robots that, that move autonomously throughout the zone to more zone-based solutions. Lots of different strategies out there. By no means one size fits all. DHL has deployed uh, three of those strategies, and we're looking at a fourth right now. So there's different strategies that, that are taking place on the market. Let's just take a look at a quick video here just to, just to highlight some of the subtle differences. Here's a picker, they're picking with a traditional pick cart. They pick the items that they need and put them to the appropriate order. Then the pick cart goes away and now all of a sudden the, uh, the robot follows the picker around the warehouse. Uh, picker's hands are free and the picker doesn't have to travel back and forth between the packing station. Next evolution, uh, the picker here follows the robot, gets all their cues from the robot's screen as far as what they need to pick 
and uh, get, gets a big productivity increase without having to reference that. Then more of a swarming strategy. Picker is no longer directly associated with a particular robot, can pick multiple robots at, at a time, can stay in their pick zone, and then another picker in another part of the warehouse can pick the remainder of that order. So you, you're cutting down on a lot of travel. And there's different strategies, as I mentioned before. A strategy where you shuttle the order back and forth between different zones in the warehouse. And now you've kind of broken that relationship between the order, the robot, and the picker themselves. So that's, that's a different type of strategy as well. And the final strategy that I talked about is a retrieval strategy where you retrieve a uh, product from racking and bring that product to, uh, to a put wall. And this is somewhat similar to the Kiva process, but here we're talking about collaborative robots that can work alongside people uh, and, and the picker at the put wall will just do the, uh, just do the sortation process, won't have to travel at all. So what does this all mean? A lot of trade-offs here, a lot of trade-offs as far as um, the, the trade-off between how much integration you have to do with your warehouse management system, or productivity, the capital, just taking a look at that table there, number of check marks, more check marks uh, denote more favorability with that particular option. So you look at the different picking strategies there, manual, uh, manual picking strategy, follow me, all the way down to the goods to person retrieval. What, what are the trade-offs between WMS integration? Obviously the manual strategy virtually already integrated with the WMS versus a goods to person retrieval system you have more WMS integration, more costs, more, th more things that you need to manipulate. Productivity, however, even though that that system was easy to, to integrate with your warehouse management system, it's not gonna be very productive. And you start to increase productivity as you bring the product directly to the picker. Capital, but uh, obviously capital will increase too because now you need more robots to perform that function. You might need 10 robots to one person. And some of these, these strategies in between, the lead me strategy, the swarming strategy, you know, you start to reduce that robot to, to person ratio. So there's all kinds of different trade-offs taking place here. And one of the strategies that we've deployed um, is the swarming strategy. And we find it strikes a pretty good balance. You know, there, there's certain profiles where we're gonna look at, at different types of picking strategies, but the swarming strategy strikes a really good balance for us. And we, we have a lot of experience with, with this, and we have a couple of deployments already, and the company we're working with is, is Locus Robotics. Uh, we leverage the, the warehouse in this system. It's a relatively easier integration into the warehouse management system. Works in a task-to-person type manner. It's user friendly, it's intuitive. This is kind of what it looks like for a picker in the warehouse. There's an iPad screen and a bin that they're picking into. Pretty easy, very scalable. Volume goes up, you add more robots into the solution. And the middleware, this is something that comes with all of these different solutions. Your traditional warehouse management system kind of you know, puts, puts work out to the floor. So it, it gives the work out to the floor and someone goes around and picks. A lot of these different strategies, they take that work and they kind of manipulate it and optimize it. So if you're picking three or four orders at once, they're trying to figure out what three or four orders should we put in that cart at the same time because maybe they're gonna be in close proximity to each other and cut down on travel. So that's something that you get with these robotic solutions. I think previously it was discussed that Hey, most of, the, most of these companies today, they're really more software companies. Uh, that's exactly what we're finding as well because there is, there is a lot of software, a lot of optimization that goes with these different solutions. A lot of flexibility too with, with the swarming approach um, where these robots, they can work in the same aisle. So I talked about congestion being an issue, especially if you have manual pick carts, big bulky pick carts. You know, could they even turn in a, in a five-foot aisle, four-foot aisle? Uh, these robots are more slim, sleek, and they can, uh, they can maneuver around each other, work in two-way navigation, a 
ability to potentially turn around and, and switch directions, shortening travel between picks. Not something that you know your traditional warehouse worker would would think of with a with a traditional aisle numbering scheme in a warehouse. A lot of warehousing, you know, you're getting people off the street to come in and to handle peaks. They're going to look at you know when you have a complex aisle numbering scheme, you give an aisle number, a, a bay number for a particular location, the height of that location. Maybe not the easiest thing, most intuitive thing, just to figure out when you get a list of locations to go and pick from. So someone who's just been there a week, who's hired for peak season, they might just take the longest approach uh, and the safest way to get from slot to slot. A robot can optimize their travel path. Uh, robots autonomously maneuver around people as well. Perhaps some of us have had these experiences uh, with, with these mobile robots where you stand, you stand somewhere and somehow the robot slows down but figures out where you are and, and is somehow able to kind of move around you. And that, that's something that we experience as well because we're, we're still going to have a lot of pickers in these operations. And replan their routes. If, if there is a block and, they, they can't, and the robot can't figure out how to move around, then it can replan its route as well. Something that's you know, uh, important to us because we don't want technicians running out onto our floor every second to try and debug, debug robots and debug automation and get it back up and running again. And that's, that's one thing that you see with a lot of traditional automation. You need mechanics, you need technicians, and if something goes wrong, you know, you're going to have some downtime. Uh, we like it when kind of, you know, the, the robots can figure out stuff themselves. The other thing is communication. What are you communicating to the picker? And, you know, with the swarming approach, you might say, okay, so, so I get it. I get how you save. Uh, you increase productivity because you, you, you don't have the uh, pickers travel up and down the entire warehouse. They stay in zones. But how do they know where to go? And you know, one of the things that, that we came up with in collaboration with Locus is, OK, let's give the pickers some cues here. Because the next robot might not be in their aisle. They might not be able to just look over their shoulder and say, OK, there's another robot that needs a pick. Let's, let's give them a little proximity indicator there that tells them where there are idle robots looking for picks that need picks uh, so that the picker can kind of plan where should they go next. And that's something that kind of helps us increase uh, utilization. With, with our work with, with the swarming approach, Locus Robotics, we have doubled productivity. And our models say we can get that up to two and a half times. And now that's, that's with a specific profile where it makes sense. But a two and a half time productivity increase uh, in, you know, in this day and age when it's so hard to find labor, uh, that is absolutely huge for us. Another benefit of the swarming approach um, and, and kind of robotic picking solutions in general is this, is this order cycle time. Sometimes the alternative to some of these different solutions, and I'll talk about batch picking in a second. I'll go into more detail about some of the others, uh, uh, some of the traditional batch picking solutions. But sometimes when you want to process a lot of volume, on that particular day, you turn to batch picking. And what that means is that you're aggregating your picks across, across a whole day's worth of orders. Um, and then you know, later on, you're, you're, you're sorting your picks at maybe a port wall or a pack station. Uh, so sometimes this is the only way to process a large amount of volume is to get a huge batch and then send it somewhere for sortation. Like, you know, think about a, a parcel sortation hub that would sort, sort these different parcels or units to each particular order. You know, again, that's a, little, that's a little more capital intensive. But if you have very, very high volume, that might be uh, the way you need to go. But there are some trade-offs when you take an order and you have to run it through those different steps in the operation, you add time. And you, you don't have as much flexibility because your order has been aggregated with thousands of orders. So in today's day and age where people are going in and saying, I want two-day delivery, or I want same-day delivery, OK, I'll have next day. You know what? I'm willing to take a, a dollar discount and get a seven-day delivery. 
uh, you know, consumers have that flexibility, uh, warehouses need, need to be able to respond to that, to be able to categorize orders and to prioritize them. And what we found is, you know, in the particular operation where we trialed Locus, it's a life science medical device operation, and it, it's out of Memphis, and it thrives on late cutoffs. It needs a late cutoff to be able to turn around an order for a surgical implant that might need to, that might be needed in an operating room the next day, the next morning. So you need those late cutoffs. So if you do that with a traditional batch picking strategy, which is one of the things we're looking at, hey, how are we going to process all this volume, all this increase in volume here that, that we're, we're supposed to see in this site? Uh, you know, one of the drawbacks of just changing to a batch process, um, you know, was that, that order cycle time. So that's, that's something that a Locus had that advantage of cutting that order cycle time as well. Okay, so in all of those, in everything that I talked about thus far, um, you know, the human is still doing that final pick process. And, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, as I said, it works within existing infrastructure and it can give you up to a two and a half times productivity increase. So, you know, that, that is just a huge benefit for us. But you might ask, okay, can you automate that final step? And certainly, you know, everyone's kind of, a lot of people are looking at this, these automated robotic picking options. Um, and Amazon has issued a robotic picking challenge for the past three years. And, you know, you can kind of see why. Even in their warehouse operation where they have Kiva, where they have, the, the, where they have their sortable units, their smaller units, uh, those operations have upwards of a couple thousand employees in each of them. Uh, even though they, they have a Kiva system. So they've been issuing these different challenges to challenge people to say, okay, you know, can you design a solution that can, for the first two years at least, 2015, 16, can you design a robot that can pick an item out of a bin? And by the way, that bin, first of all, it's going to be an, in a Kiva type bin, and there's going to be multiple bins there. But by the way, that bin will, might have five different units in it, all of different shapes and sizes, totally different items that we are going to randomly put in that bin. And we want your, your robot has to be able to identify the right item and only pick that item out of the bin. Very, very challenging thing to do, obviously. Um, so you can see the pick rates that happened 2015, 16, uh, nowhere near what a human would be picking at, you know, 40 units an hour, 70. And then, you know, worse is the accuracy, but, uh, you know, a, you know 90, warehouse uh, picking accuracy is upwards of 99.9% .9 accurate, but, and needs to be, um, but a huge exponential improvement year over year, and that's the main takeaway. Another takeaway here, if you kind of, you know, if, you, if you're in the industry and you follow, you know, what Amazon's doing, another takeaway here is what happened in 2017. The, the, the competition changed a little bit. No longer were they contestants asked to design a robot to pick out of a Kiva type bin. They were asked to design a robot that can pick overhead uh, out of a tote that's presented to it, um, which might, might suggest that, you know, maybe Maybe designing a robot to do exactly what a human did, did was, you know, is not the right answer, or maybe potentially the next generation of facilities will change. Um, so, you know, and the pick rate has gone up even further there, and the accuracy rate has, has also improved as well. So really interesting a space to kind of keep an eye on, but that is a very challenging thing to do, to, to ask a robot to pick an item uh, out of a mixed skew bin and only pick the items that are required. So another company that we've, we've been researching and looking at is Kindred, and there, there's a lot of companies starting up here in, in designing automated picking robots that are picking items. Every item that's presented to it needs to be picked. So there was a downstream batch pick process those items were dumped into a bin, and now the robot needs to pick up each item that's been presented to it and scan each item and then sort it. So every item that's presented to the robot 
needs to be picked. There's no tricks, hey, these items, uh, these items shouldn't be picked, they should go back to storage. Uh, so this is really interesting because this could kind of insert itself Again, just like before, where we talked about robots that work within existing infrastructure, this is a little different. This is a little more kind of disruptive to the operation, but it can insert itself in those operations that we have that already have port walls in place, um, and particularly in fashion apparel item, with fashion apparel warehouses. So something that we're looking at quite a bit. Uh, what, you know, this all comes down to the success rate. If the robot is going to pick up an item and it, you know, it can't get stuck, it can't just drop that item or put it in the wrong bin, if it, you know, it needs to have a very, very high accuracy rate or else all that we're doing is going and correcting what the robot just picked. So any of those accuracy rates that you saw on the slide before would nowhere near be acceptable. So, you know, what, what Kindred has done is kind of utilize artificial intelligence to help the robot. So the robot looks to grab an item and, you know, based on the orientation of the item and, and the, the dimensions, all that type of stuff, looks to grab it. Uh, and if the, and if once the robot grabs it, runs it by a scanner, then does the sort. But if the robot feels that it cannot complete that sort with a high level of confidence, then the robot will ask a technician, a remote technician, who might be working in an office somewhere else, or you know, maybe not nowhere even near that operation, will ask a remote technician to go in and to complete that task for it. And um, you know, so we're seeing kind of with some of the products we've tested. It can vary, you know, if, if uh, the robot has never encountered those types of products before, it might only be able to do about half of the picks automatically and then half require a technician override who's doing it with a joystick. But if it's something in their sweet spot, it could be 95%. Uh, it's seamless to us um, because, you know, this, this all kind of takes place and this keeps the robot working. Over time, the algorithms get better. This is kind of the machine learning. Over time, as you know, the robots kind of learn what, what did the technician do, how did the technician approach it, the, the robots start to draw on that library there and, and get a lot better. So let's, let's take a quick look at, at how this works. Again, this is pretty common in the fashion and apparel industry where you're gonna batch pick product and sort it, and then uh, that final sort is the sort to the individual order. Uh, the Gap has deployed a lot of these different kindred, um, kindred robots, as have uh, a couple other companies. So this is something that's really starting to take off as well. What we like about these collaborative robotic solutions in general is that for our industry, the 3PL industry, and you know, and I'm sure, you know, obviously, for our end customers as well, committing to you know large-scale capital investment could be a hard thing to do, where you don't necessarily know where your business is going to go in 10 years. So having some of these new commercial models, which are more variable, which are charging you more as a robot as a service, uh, a price per sort, or a monthly lease cost, very advantageous to us because you know it shows that. These companies are betting on their product and they're betting that we're going to use them a lot and they're going to make more money because we're going to sort more products uh, you know, with their technology. Or you know, if it doesn't work out in this, this operation, those robots can just pick up and move to another operation. Those are the types of things that are important you know, to us as a 3PL because we have a pretty complex uh, commercial model where you know, we have our end customers, we have our our operators, we have the technology company, we're trying to make all this work uh, on a commercial level and you know, certainly you know, want to be sure of our investments. So just to wrap up here, you know, DHL, we're involved in various digitization initiatives, a uh, lot of great advancements in the field of robotics that directly impact supply chain and warehouse, in particular, e-fulfillment operations. 
Uh, we're seeing, we've piloted quite a few of these, we probably have 10, 10 or so pilot sites. We're seeing significant productivity cycle time advantages. Uh, like I said, the, the, uh, the technology we're most uh, familiar with, the swarming approach, seeing that two and a half times productivity increase. And automated picking, we're keeping an eye on that because we think that could be one of the next evolution in, in robotics. So with that, if we have time for questions. The question was, given how fast robots are improving, you know, uh, what, what's the best strategy? Should you wait it out or should, should you kind of jump in now? I think, I think they've already a, a, a pro improved to the point where we need to jump in now because we're getting the two and a half times productivity increase uh, with them now. Now, if some of those enhancements help us to get to three times, four times, you know, we're, we're going to reap those benefits as well. I think a lot of the enhancements that we see are software related as well. So, you know, you buy the robot, you buy the hardware, and it doesn't necessarily mean in a year it's obsolete because these companies, you know, and, and we're, we're kind of giving them uh, product improvement suggestions uh, as well. Because these companies are evolving their software, you, you get the benefit of that with, with, uh, you know, with the same hardware that you might have purchased a year ago. Uh, but of course, sometimes you do, you do see, you do see uh, technologies that come along. And that's why we're, we're kind of technology agnostic as well, that you know, we're not going to place an order for you know, a million robots and just kind of store them in our warehouse and then deploy them as we need them. We'll, we'll always kind of continue to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, the question is, uh, what has enabled uh, DHL to, um, you know, really be out front and pilot these these technologies and get them into uh, our operations? I think I think our company has really kind of promoted an entrepreneurial culture, culture of continuous improvement. Um, you know, our, our CEO Frank Apple, who's quoted there, is uh, you know is very kind of concerned and sees a huge opportunity with digital disruption, it's an opportunity, it's a threat. Uh, he kind of pushes that down. He, he makes in, uh, big investments in innovation centers, you know, and um, I think that um, also we, we have good people. I mean, we have really good people who go out to trade shows, who will look at different ideas and, you know, when they, when they make these pitches to our operation, they're not laughed out of the room. There's always someone who's willing to raise their hand and, and try them. And I, I think we kind of encourage people to try out these different technologies and we'll give some corporate support to that as well. Question right here. One of the easier ways of screwing up one of these systems is to introduce from the outside an actor with a minor, you know, minor flaws in order to change or just do it one piece. How do you manage quality control at the very end to make sure that yeah. So the question was about um, how do you how do you manage quality control and make sure there's uh, you know that there, there's no no errors at the end because you know you're vulnerable to to really any kind of little disruption. Um, I think we're a very process oriented company, and um, you know certainly I think one of the main things is kind of core operational discipline. So, you know, sometimes you have these conventional warehouses and you're looking at them taking the next step and getting more digitized, but they gotta have their basics down. They gotta have good solid inventory control. If, if products end up in the wrong locations or there's not, not good discipline, employee morale, um, you know, then, then the automation is, is not, is just gonna compound some of the problems that are already taking place out there in the operation. So I think, first of all, you know, nailing the basics with a lot of kind of Six Sigma type disciplines, um, and then kind of just really walking through step by step and, and kind of sanity checking everything prior to, to launch and go live is, 
kind of how we minimize that. But even that said, you know, w with a startup, sometimes, you know, things do go wrong. It's just how quickly can you, can you fix them? Two more questions back there. The girl in the white shirt, please. Yeah, so the question was, how do you manage that, that human element when you're getting a, a two and a half times productivity increase? I'll say that we haven't encountered that situation where we've automated to the point that, hey, we, we needed to down, downsize our workforce. In the life science operation, you know, what the robots enabled us to do and our customer to do was to roll in additional divisions. So we knew that the, the customer wanted us to handle double the amount of volume in our facility. And these robots allowed us to do that because we just couldn't find that, that labor off the street. And there's been other operations where we've put in new sophisticated systems where we're going, we're going from a, a peak to an average to peak ratio of two, uh, basically 10 to one. Um, 200 people during average times, 2,000 during peak. So, you know, this is just kind of giving us a fighting chance. So during, in this type of economy, we're not necessarily seeing that, right? And, and the nature of our business too is we have 400 plus sites across the US and a lot of them are located in logistics hubs and campuses. So, you know, even if we had that scenario where we really automated one operation and, and had some additional labor because of that savings, we could potentially move them to an operation that maybe didn't lend itself to, to automation as well. So right now we're, we're kind of battling this labor shortage and uh, we haven't necessarily encountered that problem. One more question, I believe there's one over here. Yes, please. Yeah, so you discussed a little bit how Amazon would change that competition uh, in regards to how the robot or what the robot picks from. Do you mm -hmm. think it ever makes sense to invest in kind of changing up the infrastructure of the warehouse to make it more suitable to a robot? Or is that not worth the investment? Yeah, so you know, it, you know, the question was about how Amazon changed their competition. And you know, could that spur just totally changing how the warehouse is designed uh, so that everything is really conducive to, to the robots? Because a lot of what I uh, talked about today was inserting technology into existing infrastructure and why that makes sense for us. But for, for larger distribution operations that might be more cookie cutter where you know, a company like Amazon, Walmart, they're gonna have tens of these warehouses all across the US, they know their, their profile, their volume, and they can kind of design around that. That's their kind of consistent type of profile, and they're gonna give those operations a certain skew base as well. Okay, you're, you're gonna be my sortable warehouse, my non-sortable warehouse, my heavy and bulk warehouse. They can split out their volume that way, and then make, design each warehouse you know, with the right technology. So, their warehouse, their approach to automation could be a lot different than ours, where they could be looking at some of that heavy duty, you know, 100 million type uh, automation. And, you know, unless we're working with Amazon, you know, we're working with, with people who, you know, are looking for their own kind of competitive advantage and aren't necessarily at that scale, but need, need a more customized, pragmatic solution for them, right? So, so definitely people do go to that level and I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, Amazon's next generation warehouse is, you know, it's a lot more automated than some of the things that we saw today, potentially. Yeah, just stand here for a second. So with that, it's important to understand when we create these keynotes, they're, they're meant to be educational, but also inspirational. And I think we've achieved that this morning. We had Damien Sheldon from Agility Robotics come on and talking about how they're adding greater levels of navigation and control autonomy and the methods that they're using to do that how they're using simulation to train deep models to also improve navigation and control, which is pretty interesting to use simulated uh, data in order, to create, in order to train these deep models. And then certainly this combination of mixing hardware and software and an interplay with that. And, and in some sense, a classic subsumption architecture for control of these robotic systems, which is very interesting. 
John Del Chinos from Dray Jabel, of course, was talking about the growth of the robotics sector. Now is the time for building these new systems, whether you have an existing Global 2000 a company and looking to roboticize your product line or someone with a, with a young startup. He also talked about the digitalization of, of manufacturing, by extension, the digitalization of, of robotics. And, and the difference between a platform versus a solution uh, provider and where the greater opportunity may lie. And then certainly Adrian talking about the evolution of mobile robotic systems and supporting retail e-commerce picking tasks, which is very, very interesting. And moving from sort of automated net navigation to actually to, to moving from mobile solutions to grasping, grasping and manipulation. And I would add one other thing, frankly. If you think about the robotics marketplace and how it's proliferated over the last decade, there's been a number of tailwinds pushing it. So things such as the mobile communications marketplace, a huge multi-billion dollar marketplace giving you things like small accelerometers and smart software for communication, as well as things such as natural language processing and facial recognition. IoT has done the same thing. Big data, um, also now with the, the movement in machine learning and deep learning as well. I would add to one of those drivers this whole proliferation and growth of these mobile service robots in support of e-commerce retail fulfillment. This is needed to be done. Automation was absolutely needed because the business model was not going to work regardless of how much money they had. And so they were forced to come up with solutions. That acted as a driver when you have big companies like DHL and Amazon and the rest putting money and resources behind this. This opens up opportunities for people who, even given the fact that that's a large marketplace and it's the low hanging fruit, to look at other types of opportunities for indoor robots that can navigate autonomously. So with that, I would like to thank our, our last speaker, Adrian, uh, for this great presentation. Remind people that we are now moving up into the Marina Ballroom. That's where the showcase is gonna be, and that's where they're gonna have the luncheons. Again, you have to go up the escalator across, but then we're, we're done with this side of the event. So with that, once again, to thank Damien. Thank you all for being here, and I look forward to seeing you at the rest of the show.